We are starting a brand new series today as we're, we're going to be preaching through the book of Philippians uh, during the month of February. And Philippians is known as the epistle of joy. And uh, here at The Rock, like every organization, we have core values that kind of help set the culture of who we are. And I think every church somewhere has in their DNA, hopefully, the great commandment. The great commandment is love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. So we say love God, love people. Every church probably has that somewhere in their core values. And then we also talk about pursuing excellence, talking about effort, doing the best we can with what we have. And then our fourth core value that we have is choosing joy. It's this attitude of joy. And the theme of these four chapters in the book of Philippians, as I said, is joy. And what's amazing and remarkable is that Paul found joy in Christ in spite of all the difficulties he encountered in life. And so will we. I want to, before we dive into the text here, just kind of give you a little historical background for the writing of the book of Philippians and make a distinction uh, between happiness and joy. Because, of course, they're similar, uh, but they're not the same. Happiness is often related to circumstances. So if circumstances are favorable, if we perceive them to be favorable, we say we're happy. You know, we feel good physically. Our relationships are good. got money in the bank. Hey, we're happy. Um, (laughs) Happiness is related to happenings or circumstances, happenstance. Sometimes people say chance. Uh, But here's the thing with happiness. If the circumstances go against what you perceive as a positive thing, then that makes us sad and sorrowful. God has this this fruit of the Spirit. And if we see in the, the list of the fruit of the Spirit, it's number two on the list. I mean, number one is love, of course. That's the greatest. But number two is joy. And here's why joy is different than happiness. It's it's not related to chance at all, and it's not related to circumstances at all. It's a deep down confidence that all is well, no matter what the circumstance or the difficulty or the problem. And that's where it is different from happiness. Happiness. The verb to rejoice appears 74 times in the New Testament, and the noun joy refers, is, appears rather 59 times in the New Testament. So this concept is all throughout the New Testament scriptures. Uh, John MacArthur is a pastor out in California. He's got a, a website called Grace to You, which I find very helpful, gty.org, in um, kind of exegeting the scriptures. But I found this quote that he said, He said, true joy is a gift from God to those who believe the gospel. It's being produced in them by the Holy Spirit. It is a fruit of the Spirit as they receive and obey the word of God. And it's mixed with trials. That's what we're going to see in the book of Philippians. That this joy, it's mixed with trials as as we set our hope on future glory. But the trials don't keep us from joy. Again, this isn't just happiness, it's it's joy. Joy unspeakable and full of glory. Amen. Now, as the the Apostle Paul is sitting in a Roman prison, chained to a Roman guard under house arrest, he writes uh, the book of Philippians. This is his masterpiece on joy. Here's the occasion of the epistle. While he's in Rome, again, chained to a Roman guard under house arrest, he receives a gift, a gift of love from the Philippian church. The bearer of that gift is a man named Epaphrodites. And the the church has taken up an offering and they send Epaphrodites with this offering to Paul while he's in Roman prison under house arrest because he could receive visitors at that time. And so it ministers to Paul, not just in a financial way, but in a personal way. 
He's overwhelmed by the love and the affection of the Philippians. And so under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he writes back this letter to express to them his love, his concern, that they sustain unity in the faith, to let them know that he is praying for them, and to let them know what a joy that that this church is to him. And also to send Epaphrodites back to them because he feels they need him more than he does. Now, let me give you a little bit of the context, why this church was so important to Paul. In the book of Acts, on Paul's second missionary journey, he's trying to discern the will of God. Have you ever done that? God, should I go here? Should I take this job? Should I move here? Did I make a mistake? What am I supposed to do? And so the the leaders of the church are trying to figure out where, where they're supposed to go next to plant more churches. And so they try to go to this one thing, and there's a there's a closed door. They try to do this, go to this other region. The Holy Spirit forbids them. They're trying to figure it out. And all of a sudden, one night, Paul has a vision. And he sees a man from Macedonia. What's interesting about Macedonia, that's Europe. Up to this point, Paul has been ministering in Asia Minor, Asia. But this is the first time Europe And in this vision, he sees a man from Macedonia. I don't know how he recognized him, maybe the color of his skin or his garments, I'm not sure. But the man from Macedonia is reaching out to Paul and says, Paul, come over here and preach to us. Paul, come on over. This is, by the way, known as the Macedonian call. If anyone says, I've received a Macedonian call, then they've received information from the Spirit of God for them to go to a certain place. And so he gets the Macedonian call. He talks to the brothers after he said, hey, here's what happened last night. This guy from Macedonia is telling me to come. And so they conclude, okay, that's where we're supposed to go. So here he goes with his companions. They go to Europe. And they find themselves in Philippi. And what's interesting about Philippi, it doesn't appear that there was a Jewish contingency there. No, there were no synagogues, most likely, because when Paul would go to a city to plant a church, the first place they would go is the synagogue because the gospel is for the Jew first, then the Gentile. They'd go to the synagogue, preach the gospel there. They'd get booted out, take some of the folks from the synagogue, go plant a church. But there's no synagogue here that he goes to. He goes down to the banks of a river and preaches the gospel, and some people come and, and get saved. And one of them in particular is a woman named Lydia who, I, I'm not saying this really happened, but some people think Paul was sweet on Lydia. I don't know. He mentions her several times in his epistles. She was a seller of purple. And so she hears the gospel. She gets saved. She gets baptized. And she says to Paul, well, Paul, if you consider me now a true believer, then come to my house. And um, so he does. He goes to her house and they do a house church in this first European church, the first church planted on the continent of Europe, right here. And so this is a very special church, not only in the calling, you know, how it came about that he was to go there and plant the church, but in some of the people he meets. They're just a warm, loving group of people, and he just connects with them. And plus, there's just dramatic things that happen. So there's a slave girl following him, and he casts the devil out of her, and They get an uproar. They throw him in prison. God busts him out of prison, and he ends up at the the Philippian jailer. You know, when he sees he's busted out of prison, he's going to kill himself. Paul says, don't do that, and tells him how to get saved. The jailer gets saved. The jailer takes him to his house. His entire household gets saved and baptized. So this is what he's remembering as he's writing this letter. These people are dear to him. God called him to plant this church. God showed up. He loves the people here. They have sacrificially given to meet the needs of Paul. And so while he's in prison now, while he's suffering in prison, not knowing if he's going to see another day, not knowing if Caesar's going to give him the thumbs down and he gets executed, which ultimately did happen to him, but he doesn't know. And so this is what's going on at this time. And so Paul is a great example of someone who shows us that true joy is an unwavering constant in a spirit-filled life. 
regardless of the circumstances, regardless if you're chained up, not knowing if you're going to live another day, you can still be full of joy. And this comes through in this letter, as we said. There was an um, American pastor, Bible teacher, and author who died in 2019. His name is Warren, uh, Warren Wearsby. He died at 89 years of age, but just kind of looking through, he's, he does a lot of commentaries, these little commentaries on some of the epistles in the Scripture. And if you're looking for just a good commentary, um, how to kind of outline a book of the Bible, look at some of Warren Wearsby's stuff. I have a hard time saying his last name, Warren Wearsby. Um, but he said something, I was kind of looking at his commentary uh, before doing these, these messages, and he said this, and this could really be the theme for this whole month. The secret of Christian joy is found in the way the believer thinks, his attitudes. Choosing joy, an attitude of joy. If I had a big, I probably should have done this as a prop here, a big cup of water up here on the pulpit here, and it was at the half mark. How many of you would look at that and say, that's half full? How many of you would you look at and say, that's half empty? Well, it's half, that's true. But your perspective is kind of what <laughs> clouds or <are> co- <laughs> it, it filters the way you see the world. Are you kind of a half empty or a half full kind of person? Paul was a half full. He was the optimist. Yeah, I'm a realist. Well, you can be a realist and still acknowledge that's half full. Or you can look at it and say it's half empty. It's kind of where, you, where do you put your focus? You can have so many things going well, so many things going right in your life, and just a couple little foxes nipping at your heels, and you're so focused on that that you get depressed and down and angry. Why not focus on the half full, the good stuff that's happening? I heard this years ago, the average pastor leaves a church because of seven people. There may be hundreds in the congregation, but seven people are down, discouraged, upset with them, and so he's just like, I'm out of here. You know, the 93% were, it was great, but the seven people just got him down. There's always going to be negative in life. There's always going to be circumstances coming against you, buffeting you. That's it's called being human, living on planet Earth in a sinful world. But we, as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, filled with the same spirit that Christ had, who the writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews chapter 1, was anointed with joy above all his brethren, we have that spirit of, the, of God in us, and we need to be the that's half full kind of people. Our attitudes, full of joy, regardless of circumstances, even in prison, even when you're battling through a sickness, even when you're discouraged with your dead-end job, even when you don't feel like you have anything to look forward to. No. You know the creator of the universe. You have the spirit of the living God on the inside of you. You have a, a mandate from heaven to share this good news with other people. There's always something to be joyful about. But it's a choice, isn't it? We'll take a look at how Paul kept his focus, what his perspective was like, even in the middle of suffering, how he kept it in suffering. There's three things I kind of want to emphasize here today. The first is focus on building godly relationships. Those relationships cause us to not lose perspective even when we're suffering. You've heard this probably before, but I've heard, I used to hear this a lot 20 years ago when I was 
like looking for sermon illustrations, people would say, I've never one time heard someone on their deathbed say, I wish I spent more time at work. I wish I spent more time storing away money. He said, but I always hear people say, I wish I had spent more time with my family, and my friends, with those things that really mattered. Relationships matter more than stuff. Paul, again, sitting in prison, he writes this. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi. Again, writing to this church that he planted. Together with the overseers and the deacons there, grace, peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. He always starts grace and peace, grace and peace. A lot of times he ends that way too. A lot of times I'll end my emails and stuff with that, grace and peace. Grace and peace is a good way to start. It's a good way to end. The grace of God and the peace of God. And now he begins, you can begin to see his heart for these people. I thank my God every time I remember you. I thank God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy. I pray with joy. It's not a drudgery. It's a joy to pray for you. Because I'm remembering you. I'm remembering the fellowship that we've enjoyed, the relationships that we've built, the partnership because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I'm confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. That's how I pray for you. I pray all the time for our church family. Lord, I pray for, that Christ would be formed in each one of us. We would know the hope to which we have been called. Lord, bless our church family with the knowledge of you. Every need, everything we need for life and godliness is found through the knowledge of God. Lord, just bless us. And every time he would think of them and pray for them, he would pray with joy because of their partnership. You know, it's funny, grieving is a funny thing. On March 12th last year, uh, my dad passed away. And um, for several months, I, I had the joy of the Lord, but I just was mourn with those who mourn. I was just mourning. So I was sad and I would cry just randomly, you know, just thinking about him. But I noticed kind of a shift and I maybe grieving, mourning's a little different for everybody. But after a few months, I, I just remember... There was like a shift in where I wasn't sorrowful anymore. A little sad still once in a while, but I'd remember him or something he said or one of his uh, eccentric, idiocentric, idiosyncrasies and bring a smile to my face. Actually, driving in this morning, talking about my dad and some of the things, because I used to shop for him every week towards the end when he couldn't get out. And he would always have a list for me. It's kind of funny because when I was a little kid, my parents were divorced when I was 12. But dad always traveled all over the world. And every time he'd come home, right up into the time when he started to not feel well and ended up in, the, in like a nursing home situation, assisted living, he would always bring me a gift. He would bring me a hunting magazine, a knife, a trinket from some one of his travels in the world. And I'm, I'm, I mean, every time I saw him, his, his love language must have been gift giving because he always brought me a gift. And then at the, the last few years of his life, the last two or so, two or three, it kind of the roles reversed. He couldn't physically, mobility was a thing. He couldn't get around. And so he'd have a list. And every time I went to see him, I would bring him something. And I just remember, well, that's, that's a privilege to be able to do that. He brought me gifts all those years. And now I get a chance to kind of reciprocate. I get to do what he did for me. It's kind of an interesting way of life, but the point is this. Every time I remember him now, there's joy. Relationships matter. We don't want to take them for granted, do we? And pray for joy, with joy as we remember we have joy. And we pray that God's work would be completed in us. And, of course, that is the hope of the believer, that one day we're going to be, all be together with the Lord. He goes on, to, you, you hear the affection that he has for this church. It's right for me to feel this way about all of you. I have you in my heart. So whether I'm in chains 
or defending and confirming the gospel. All of you are sharing in God's grace with me. And God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. He's longing for them. Terms of endearment, terms of affection. I, I long to be with you. I just love you guys. You know, one of the things in some of my travels, um, my dad took me to some places and I've done a few mission trips and things, but one of the things I've noticed uh, when I visited areas where people don't have as much uh, in terms of material possessions and financial things that we do, is I've noticed oftentimes their relationships seem more important and deeper. And so what you'll notice oftentimes, um, if you've traveled, you probably attest to what I'm saying, especially with the believers, is there's this, the fellowship is kind of like the highlight of the day. I remember hearing a missionary story saying, so he's, he's in, I can't remember which country it was, maybe Mexico, and he's, they're on a mission trip, and they've got to they've be in this town at a certain time, and the vehicle breaks down. And the American missionary is like pacing. We got to get this thing fixed. We, we got to be in town here in two hours. And um, they're there for like eight hours, just hanging around, the, you know, drinking lemonade or whatever they're doing. And the missionary is like right beside himself. Just we're, we're not accomplishing what we're supposed to be accomplishing. We, we got to be there. We're doing something for God. And uh, so all the, the native folks were just sitting around and laughing and joking and and saying, look at this crazy American, just thinks it's all about going there. He's got to just enjoy the ride. Enjoy the fellow. We're just hanging out together. I heard that story of a, a dad and his son went fishing. They went fishing all day long, and they caught zero. They came home. You know, dad's putting the stuff away, and his wife said, so how was it? He says, lousy. We fished the entire day, caught nothing. What a waste. Then she finds a son, 10-year-old boy. Johnny, how was, how was today? He said, it was the best day of my life. I got to spend all day with my dad. Just a matter of perspective, isn't it? He goes on to say this, and this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge, depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and the praise of God. It's my prayer for you. Parents, we need to pray for our kids like that our friends like that. Lord, increase their knowledge and the depth of their insight that they may know you, that they may be about your business, that they may know what's pure, and that they may know what's blameless for the day of Christ. Relationships. What keeps us grounded is when we focus, especially in the middle of trying circumstances, suffering. We focus on those relationships that God has given us that bring such depth quality and meaning to life. Second thing is this. In the middle of Paul's suffering as he's writing this letter of joy, he remembers his purpose, the call that God has for him. What the church is to be about, and that is spreading the gospel, the good news of Jesus for the glory of God and for the well-being of others. He always keeps that in front of him. Let's take a look here in Philippians 1 verses 12 to 14, and you're going to notice three things, three of these unusual tools that would distract or frustrate most people, but Paul sees it all kind of flowing together for a purpose, and that purpose is to spread the gospel throughout Rome. The first are Paul's chains. He says, now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. What's happened? He's been beaten He's been, they tried to pull him apart limb to limb. He's been shipwrecked. He's been stoned. And I'm not talking about cannabis here. What is it with all the cannabis stores popping up? Do people really like pot that much? 
Oh, it's for medicinal purposes. Oh, yeah. Okay. I got distracted. That was what happened to me that actually served to advance the gospel. And as a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else, I'm in chains for Christ. Can you imagine having that attitude? The reason I'm in chains is, is for the Lord. I'm not going to get down on the mully grubs. The, the gospel is advancing because of these changed. People are encouraged because I'm suffering and they see standing for righteousness means persecution. They're like, Pfft. and that's what, you know what? When the heat gets turned up, true Christians just dig in more and go, mm. we're standing for truth. There's a battle of good and evil here. We're not just wrestling against flesh and blood. There are principalities and powers that are trying to take people out for eternity, but we stand in the kingdom. We stand on the rock. We stand with the gospel. Amen. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord, and they dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. Paul's chains had a purpose. And then we see Paul's critics. It's true, verse 15, that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, those that are preaching out of goodwill, knowing that I am put here in prison for the defense of the gospel. And the former, they preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing they can stir up trouble for me while I'm in change. I don't care. What does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached, and because of this I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice. Why? Because his purpose. He knows the gospel's getting out. For I know that through your prayers and God's provision, I like that, your prayers, God's provision of the spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. It's going to turn out for my good and the gospel is being preached. Have you ever wondered why you could have a, a preacher who is a hypocrite, living in sin, in it for the money, affairs, and you look at him and preaches the gospel, people get saved. And then he gets found out and, you know, his, his whole life and house comes crashing down because it always does. Be sure your sin will find you out. And we get all confused. Well, how could that be? How could that, you know, that adulterous, crazy, greedy preacher see all those people come to faith in Christ? It doesn't make sense. How could God allow that? Well, here Paul's saying, hey, listen, some people are preaching out of envy, greed, rivalry, wrong motives. They're messed up people. And when someone explained this to me, I found, oh, that's how this happens. God has obligated himself to convict people of sin and righteousness of judgment when the message of the gospel is preached. The messenger can be messed up and be sure that that messenger's sin will find him out. But the message is pure. The message is from God. So if the, even if the vessel is impure and messed up, don't get confused. Don't get disillusioned if you see... Now, God forbid that ever happens to me, but if it did, don't get all discouraged and all, they're all a bunch of hypocrites. It's the message from God. The gospel is God's message to the world, the good news for the world, that God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That message supersedes the morality of the preacher. Now, don't get me wrong. We should preach out of right motives. We should live a holy, godly lifestyle. But it's the message that has the power. It's the gospel. And Paul said, for that, I am grateful. Kept his eye on the prize. It's the gospel is getting out. So my chains, my critics, and then my crisis. He's, he's, he's in a dilemma. We're going to see that. Regardless. The gospel is being preached. People are being reached. Amen. All right. I eagerly expect, this is verse 20, and hope that I will no way be ashamed. 
I, I don't want to be ashamed. But we'll have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. Then he utters these famous words, verse 21. I love this. For to me, to live is Christ. And to die is gain. And here's the dilemma. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yeah, what shall I choose? I don't know. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. You know, for the believer, if you die, it gets better. Isn't that amazing? You die, it's better. But it's more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith. So that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. I'm in a dilemma. I have a personal crisis. I want to leave this earth and go to be with Christ, which is far better, but I know it's more needful for me to hang around to help you for now. So because of Paul's changed, Christ was known, and because of his critics, Christ was preached, but because of his crisis, Christ was magnified. And Paul was not afraid of life or death. Either way, he was going to magnify Christ in his body. Either way, he was going to stand for the gospel. And either way, he was going to be full of joy. Finally, we'll wind it up with this. Choose to trust God. Choose to trust God. Whatever happens... Conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. This is Philippians 1.27. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them. They will be destroyed but you will be saved, and that by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ not only to believe in Him, but also to suffer for Him. Now, I like the believing part, but in my flesh, I don't like that suffering part, do you? And since you're going to go through the same struggle you saw I had and now hear that I still have, Suffering. We suffer, and Peter talks about this. There's two ways to suffer. You're going to suffer regardless. It's part of being human, part of our existence here. And one way you suffer for doing the wrong thing, and there's no glory in that. The second, you suffer for doing the right thing, and there's no shame in that. But suffering is a part of our life. I remember, I think it was the 90s, when you were hearing a lot about the health and wealth gospel and, you know, because the economy was doing pretty good and people were, I don't know, churches were, it was easy in those days. And by that, I mean it was many per people persecuting you. You could kind of live in both camps. You could still be kind of worldly and still have one foot in the church and like nobody would really notice. But have you noticed the last few years that if you're going to stand for God, you, you're going to have critics. You can't stand for the truth of God's word and appear neutral anymore because of the way that culture has gone, the way society goes. If you stand for the Word of God, you stand for His righteousness, His purity. You stand for godly marriage 
we're opposed to anything ungodly, whether it's abortion, it are these social issues, these moral issues, homosexuality, transgenderism, because we love people and we love the truth of God. We try to help people and pull, pull them out of that. But once you say that and say, I stand for God, you're stereotyped. You're persecuted. I can't tell you how many people we've had leave this church over the, the years. I've actually had people walk up in the middle of the sermon and walk right out in a huff because they perceive that when we, we talk about sin like the Bible does, it's, hey, this is the reason that Jesus came. He came for you and me to save us from our sins. But we take a, t a stand against sin because God does. We stand for righteousness. That's what love is. Love is, has to be sincere. Hate that which is evil. Cling to that which is good. But when you do that, people perceive that to be as unloving. They're, they're deceived. They think that's, that's unkind. Because I know people that struggle with that sin, and they're wonderful. Well, praise God. I'm glad they're wonderful. But they're sinners, like us all. That's why Jesus came. But when you stand for righteousness, there is a distinction. You will not be accepted by society. Now, that doesn't mean we're arrogant. We shouldn't be hypocritical. The Bible says, in meekness, instruct those who oppose themselves. We should clearly, kindly tell the truth. But people won't accept that. Jesus said, because people's, they're, they're in darkness and they don't want to come into the light for fear their deeds will be exposed. And so you're going to be persecuted. You're going to suffer. Paul was suffering for the gospel. All those who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. But take heart. You're blessed. You want to be blessed? Yeah, I want to be blessed. Woo-woo. Okay, here's how you'd be blessed. You ready? Jesus said it as, as he closes out the Sermon on the Mount, and I'll close the message with this. Blessed are you when people insult you. Blessed are you when people persecute you. Blessed are you when people falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Here it is. You ready? Bring it at home. Rejoice and be glad. Because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You want to be blessed? You want to rejoice and be glad? Stand for the gospel. Stand for the message that God has sent into the world to give the world hope. And that, that is, there is a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave his life to pay for our sins. Put your trust in him. Turn to him. Away from sin and say, Lord, I trust you. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for what you've done. Forgive my sin. Put your spirit in me. I want this joy. I want the joy of the Lord in my life. And that joy is not dependent on circumstances. It's in spite of it. Would you pray with me? Our gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for Christ. Thank you for the privilege of walking in the light. Thank you for the truth. Thank you, Lord, for your holy word. Thank you, Lord, that somebody told us the truth about our sin, that we needed to forsake it, and that we needed to put our trust and our faith in you alone to make us righteous to remove our guilt and our shame. 
And Lord, you have done it and you will do it for every man, woman, boy, and girl on planet earth who calls on Jesus. That's the good news. Thank you for putting your spirit inside of us. Thank you for the joy that we experience and the love each and every day. It's because of you. Pray these things and your blessing over this people, Lord, in Christ's name. Amen.